So the topic indeed is to achieve sustainable impact at scale. So I, I came up with this, actually a colleague of mine came up with this title of creating or designing an inclusive business unicorn. I think the, the topic of unicorns is, is unusual when we talk about inclusive or impactful businesses. But indeed, unicorns uh, exist when we talk about startups because they are able to achieve $1 billion in, in value, and uh, which means that they are expected to grow exponentially. And isn't it what we are looking for when we think about inclusive businesses that are there to tackle problems that are immense? Uh, that wouldn't we want to have such an exponential growth in order to reach the hundreds of millions, the billions of people who actually need these products or services? So the, the thinking has been, can we learn something from these unicorns uh, to try to design uh, business, inclusive businesses, so they can scale rapidly? The, that's the first, uh, I would say, starting point in, in this thinking. But the, the second one is, is a much older one, uh, which is, uh, can we uh, actually combine uh, having positive impact on people and planet, can we combine that with profit? These are the two dilemmas that uh, inclusive businesses face. Uh, one is achieve positive impact, yet be profitable, and achieve impact and yet scale up rapidly. So what I'm going to try to present today is kind of a very summarized version of, uh, of thinking on the matter, which is uh, informed by uh, successful inclusive businesses that we have seen, but in many cases also successful for-profit businesses that have achieved impact and scale. <clears throat> so, um, this is the framework we are going to follow. It's composed of the three topics Deborah was mentioning designing a holistic value proposition, which is made of three blocks, the providing all the solution, but only the solution, yet for all the stakeholders. That will be the first chapter, if you want, in this presentation. The second one is designing, building a sustainable delivery system by leveraging some unlimited free resources minimizing the use of the limited resources you need and making sure they can be sourced sustainably. The third chapter, which is Can you hear me? Yes, you're back. Yes, all right. So I, I was, someone muted me. Uh, I take this as a rebellion from the crowd. Uh, the, the third chapter is designing and igniting an exponential growth engine. So let me turn to the first of these blocks, providing all the solution to our clients. What we mean by that, and let me take you an example. Many of you will be familiar with the One Acre Fund. The One Acre Fund provides a set of inputs and services to smallholder farmers. But when you look on the left of the chart, when typically a smallholder farmers buy these inputs from traders, uh, they pay about $93 per acre. When they buy it from the one acre fund, they are paying 26% more because they're also paying for their interest rates, the insurance and the program costs that are charged on top of, of the inputs even though the inputs are a bit cheaper because uh, One Acre Fund gets a better deal. So uh, despite the fact that they are charging more than input traders, we know that in, uh, that was in 2014 in Kenya, over 80,000 farmers were ready to pay a premium for a holistic bundle that provide the certified quality inputs, delivery at time of planting, training, flexible payment terms, and crop and death insurance. Interestingly, they achieved the 100% repayment rate. Oftentimes, it is thought that poor people need cheap products. What we have found again and again 
is what they need is our risk-free solutions, things that do actually solve their problem. And if you want to solve the problem of uh, a customer, you, in general, cannot limit yourself to providing only one part of the solution. You need to provide all the package that is required for them to get the full value they expect from their investment. There are multiple examples, as I told you, in, in the um, social enterprise or social business world, but there is also one which everybody is familiar with, uh, which is um, some one company decided once to tackle the problem of bad coffee. And they realized that this was not sufficient to be provided uh, coffee beans, grounded or not, in order to guarantee that consumers would get full benefit of this experience, they needed to be able to control the water temperature, the pressure, uh, the, the grinding of the coffee, and the conservation of the coffee. So that's obviously what Nespresso did. Now, two interesting things is by doing this, Nespresso uh, created a business which is much more profitable than just coffee beans, but also they had to stretch the corporation focus on doing things that a, a typical consumer goods company selling coffee would not do. So they had to expand the definition of their business model to do things that uh, are required in order to guarantee the full quality, the full delivery of this full solution to their customers. And when we talk to our clients, oftentimes this is the limitation. Companies don't feel comfortable getting out of their comfort zone and doing things that they are not used to. But it is the price to pay in order to deliver all the solution to our customers. The second aspect of uh, this value proposition is that, yes, you need to cover all the solution, but only the solution that your customers really need. Um, and a good example, I believe, is the model of Gramin Shakti about 20 years ago in Bangladesh. Uh, throughout the world at that time, there were some grant funded programs that wanted to provide electricity in for rural households. And they started from the premise that these households were poor, that they would never be able to afford the full system, and therefore they needed a subsidy. But because they were going to get a subsidy, we needed to make sure they would get very high quality solar home systems, which meant solar home system that would um, continue providing light even if there was a cloud in the sky for uh, several days. So this meant a larger battery, meant a larger solar panel, um, and this made it very expensive, hence unaffordable, which confirmed the initial idea of these people that the poor actually needed a subsidy. But as a result, this led to villages being offered uh, solar home systems, which led to clientelism and very poor maintenance service, because when you are given a solar home system, you are not in a position to demand a good service. On the contrary, Gramin Shakti started from a completely different standpoint. They said, we want to make this cash neutral. Families spend in average $8 a month in lighting, be it a uh, kerosene lamps or batteries or candles and we are going they can spend eight dollars a month so if we extend to them a loan for say 10 years um, what how much could we could they afford to pay and they could afford to buy 150 dollars solar home system at that time that meant that if there was no sun for a couple of days you would have to, the solar home system would run out of electricity and you needed to buy yourself to use again your kerosene lamp a few days a year but because consumers were actually buying paying for this solar home system Garmin Shakti was all able to offer a risk-free solution at that time a technician a maintenance technician would come every month uh, to make sure the system worked and he was collecting the payment from the farmer. So the farmer knew that the technician would come every month. He was certain of it. The other thing is that if at any point in time during these 10 years, the farmer had a problem, 
he could get his money back uh, from uh, Gramin Shakti. And this de delivered an excellent service, obviously. Uh, today, there is about 1.8 1, 1. million solar home systems that have sold, been sold by Gramin Shakti alone. Uh, they had competitors who joined the crowd, so a good 5 million solar home systems have been sold in Bangladesh, serving over 15% of the Bangladeshi population. So we see here that someone who really said, this is the, the basic, the most frugal solution people need, but then we are going to deliver it in 100% of the cases, this was the solution that provided the best results. So all the solution, excuse me, a good example you may have in mind is the low cost airlines, Southwest and then EasyJet and Ryanair, uh, kick the, uh, beat the large uh, airlines, the conventional airlines, by providing more basic services, but they were on time, they were cheap, were safe enough, and that maybe didn't have all the, the nice uh, bells and whistles of uh, the traditional airlines that provided um, a much better service of what people really wanted and were ready to pay for. And we know the success of these, of these companies. So we have covered all the solution, yet only the solution, but we also need to think about all the stakeholders involved. Let me give you the example of two programs run by a firm called Livelihoods Firms. In Mexico, uh, in Aguascalientes, there is a real issue of aquifer deficit. So the water tables are insufficient because of very poor agricultural practices. And there is a water utility and a bottling plant who are very concerned with the water resources. And the Mexican government is very concerned with the farmer livelihoods. So you have a multiple set of stakeholders who are concerned with the situation but none of them can come up with a solution alone. Similarly, in Madagascar, in, uh, for vanilla, uh, there is a real issue of um, uh, low income, of poverty, because of poor quality, problems of weather, low productivity, etc. Now, different consumer good companies would like to source sustainable and fully traceable vanilla. And a number of aid, aid agencies are very want to fight this poverty trap, the, uh, people from Madagascar uh, are in. Now, again, you have a multiple set of stakeholders. Each of them would like the problem to be solved, but none of them alone is ready or able to, to tackle it. So we have here the model that uh, Livelihoods Farm, Funds for Family Farming has come up with. You have, uh, if you look at the smallholder farmer at the bottom, He's provided with training equipment and technical assistance by the project implementer, which is funded by the Livelihood Fund. The Livelihood Fund and the, the smallholder farmers sell their uh, sustainable goods to buyers. And the buyers are not only paying the farmers, but they are also paying the Livelihood Funds based on the result-based fee. Additional uh, funders, the private and public funders, are also paying the livelihood funds for these results. So you could say the buyers and the funders are off-takers. They are buying different aspects of the value delivered by the fund. And now there are investors in this fund who are getting the returns on this investment. So it's a complex setup, indeed, but it's one that allows, enables, to get different people to pay for the different tranches of benefits that a program is, uh, is delivering and is very impactful. Now, this may sound like, like a curio, curious NGO type uh, setup, but when you look at urban transport, uh, you might be interested in knowing that this is an example of Hong Kong and the example of London, that the way the, the sources of revenue of an tr urban transport operator is also multiple. In the case of London, you have about 55% of revenues that come from what uh, uh, riders are paying. They also get grants, but they charge rents uh, and they also sell for media. In the case of the uh, Hong Kong, uh, actually they are making a lot of money out of their stations. They rent uh, space to shops, they 
they sell advertising, they sell telecom services. So having different sources of revenue, different type of off takers for your revenue model is not something that is so unusual and can be done very effectively. So we have covered the holistic value proposition. All the solution, yet only the solution, but for all stakeholders. Let's assume we have done that. Now we need to deliver it. We need to deliver it and we need to deliver it at scale. So uh, one uh, first idea is to leverage unlimited resources. And this sounds like a good idea if you want to reach hundreds of millions of people. What do we mean by that? Let me give you the example of Codensa. Codensa is an electric utility in Bogota, in Colombia. And they were looking at the, they had a large number of their customers were very poor households that use very little electricity. And they were thinking about what can we do to get them to buy more electricity from us? And they probably did a market research that told them, look, they buy little electricity because these people don't have electric appliances. If they don't have electric appliances because no one wants to give them a credit because they are very poor. And Codensa realized that among their customers, some of them were paying their electricity bill on time for, for years and that they were very credit worthy people. So they, they had the idea of saying, OK, we are going to send a little leaflet to these good paying households and we are going to tell them, look, if you want a credit from us, uh, you could go to this place, sign a piece of paper, and then you get a voucher and you could go to a retail shop we have a partnership with to buy yourself a computer or a TV screen. And you will see in your next monthly bill for electricity, there will be an additional line which will be paying back uh, your loan. Uh, in, uh, in a few years, Codensa has reached a loan portfolio of $500 million. About 80% of these consumers never had access to any credit in their lives. And about 30% of computers sold in Bogota were sold through Codensa. So here you have an example that allowed to reach scale very fast in a very dramatic fashion because Codensa was leveraging the data they had about the consumers and the invoicing system, which was basically free at zero marginal cost and the money collection system they already had in place. So they were leveraging their infrastructure to deliver this service. And in doing so, uh, they were not using, they were not damaging this infrastructure. On the contrary, they were actually enhancing these assets as they were using them. And I could give you again, many other examples of uh, leveraging unlimited resources uh, to, that are free and um, that uh, are extremely valuable uh, for our program. Um, another example in the for-profit world that everybody has knows is Airbnb which managed to grow extremely fast because they realized there were all these idle assets, all these empty rooms that could be leveraged through a platform. And uh, again, here we see I unlimited idle free resources, which can be used to provide services or products at a very large scale. Now, you can do everything you want about leveraging these unlimited resources. At some point in time, some of these resources will be limited and expensive. And then you need to do your best. And this is some things that companies usually are pretty good at, that uh, minimizing the use of these limited product resources, making them very productive. But uh, I think a phenomenal example is the Aravin eye care system in India which operates people for eye surgery and typically for cataract. And these, the surgeons of the Aravin system are five times more productive than Western surgeons because 
uh, Aravin organize eye camps that allows to identify people who are in need of surgery. Uh, so there is a, a flow of, um, of patients who come to the hospital. The doctors only do what doctors are needed for. So they focus on diagnostic and surgery. And here you see there is only one surgeon in this room and they are focused on doing the, the surgery, diagnostic and surgery. And you have nurses who are doing everything that where you don't need a doctor. They have performed in 2018 about 600,000 surgeries. And the cost is about 1% of the cost of the National Health Service in the UK. And not only the cost is infinitely lower, but they have half the number of complications. So the service level is much better. So I think it's, a, it's an interesting example of by how much can you minimize the use of limited resources. Um, the, the last thing you need to do if you want to be really sustainable and at scale is to make sure that these limited resources are sustainable. Not surprisingly, Aravin also has a training program to train more surgeons. But a typical example is the one of agriculture. Um, the new focus of large corporates and NGOs is really about regenerative agriculture. So it's not enough, I would say, to minimize the damage to the soil, um, but it's also important to ensure that while you use this soil, you are using growing practices that indeed improve the health of the land. So at the end of the season, not only do you get a crop, but also your assets have been uh, enhanced. And uh, the regenerative agriculture, I think, is a very good uh, example and uh, concept um, to think through uh, to make sure your limited resources are indeed managed in a sustainable way. So let's assume we have a holistic value proposition. Let's assume we have designed and built a sustainable delivery system. You could be very satisfied with yourself. Uh, you could have actually a profitable inclusive business. But that doesn't tell you that it is going to grow, to grow exponentially. So, and that's where I think the, the example of unicorns is very intriguing. And when you look at the models or the concepts that are behind this exponential growth, you typically find network effects. So a network effect is a good a typical example or traditional example is the one of a phone. The, the first person who bought himself or herself a phone, it was, it was not very useful, right? You needed at least two people to have a phone. But the more people bought phones, the more value it had for the users. And by the way, the lower the cost. So the direct network effect is really saying the more the merrier, the more users, the more value the services have. And this is typically the, the, the concept that is leading to one obvious positive direct network effect, which is the word of, word of mouth. When you look at the marketing uh, of a product or a service in a village, uh, the, the little framework on the left helps uh, explain the, the logic. The, the first thing you start with the population of the village and you are going to do activities that hopefully are going to generate a number of prospects that are tempted by your product, that are aware of your product. And then you need to convince these people to actually buy. And then you need to convince these buyers um, to, to make sure they are satisfied so they became loyal users and they don't become dissatisfied users. Because if you get loyal users, they will start telling their friends um, about it. What we see in many organizations, many companies, is that they do a lot of marketing, a lot of advocacy, a lot of uh, promotions, a lot of demonstrations, but that they don't spend a lot of time making sure their users are satisfied. I had an example of a company that was saying, look, 80% of our buyers are very happy uh, with the product 
and uh, a few years later, uh, their, their income have improved, their kids go to school. It is a fantastic really. Yet we need to do advertising. We need to do a lot of promotion. Uh, we need to pay fixed salaries to our salesmen because it's very difficult to convince people to buy. And I was thinking, how is it? So it is so fantastic. How is it? It is difficult to convince people to buy. And then we asked, what about the other 20%, you know, the ones who are not satisfied? And what we found out that these 20% were people who were never able to use the equipment they bought, or when it broke down, no one was ready to uh, able to fix it. So they had 20% of customers who were really unhappy, really unhappy. And as you all know, unhappy users, unhappy customers are much more vocal than satisfied ones. So what this company should have done instead of doing advertising and promotions, they should have tried to identify these unsatisfied users and make sure they were very satisfied. And this is what Patrimonio Oil, an organization in, um, uh, uh, it's a program of CEMEX, a cement company in Mexico, who have really focused on ensuring users are satisfied. So they actually uh, use the net promoter score uh, framework and methodology to identify whether or not a given customer would be willing to uh, uh, recommend a patrimonial to their friends. Uh, they also hire as uh, salespeople former satisfied users. Um, and the focus really is about ensuring 100% satisfaction. Interestingly, in the case of Patrimonioi, the compensation of the salespeople is tied to the not net promoter score of their customers. So uh, I would say that the good marketing starts after the sale. And this is what's going to generate uh, a positive uh, word of mouth, which is the first example of a very effective direct network effect. Another one is a bit different, but is the one um, uh, of what happens when you have a common good. This is a program run by BRAC in, in Bangladesh, which is about sanitation. If you want in, in a village, in order to make sure the water tables are not polluted, you need to make sure that all the houses within the village have proper sanitation, proper latrines. And so the program that BRAC has created is a program where they bring together an, a, a number of uh, people from the village and they draw a map, which is a piece of cardboard you see on the screen. They draw a map of the village and they, they put red and, and green uh, 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 drawings uh, to identify we, who has a good latrine, a proper latrine or not. And then they go around the village and they exert quite a bit of peer pressure. Now, interestingly, in Bangladesh, there is also money available for the very poor households in order to get a subsidy to buy the latrine. But here the objective is really to get everybody in the village to get a, a proper latrine and by leveraging uh, the community. Again, extremely fast growth uh, throughout Bangladesh of, of this program. A more complicated type of network effect is the indirect network effect, but hopefully uh, you will understand it if you look at the, way, the left side of the, of the graph. Um, this is what happens when you're looking for a taxi, right? You, or be it on Uber or by walking at the railway station, um, you, you would like to be the only customer, right? But you know that if you were the only customer, you, it would be very unlikely that you will have lots of taxis waiting for you. Right? So uh, on the one hand, you are in competition with the other riders. Um, but at the same time, you know that if you need to have more riders for, in order to have more taxis waiting. 
Similarly, the taxi would like to be the only one in the queue, but they know that if they are the only taxi in the village or in the city, they, they will, the, the riders will not uh, get used, uh, be used to the taxis, they may buy themselves a car. So when you are uh, Uber entering a new city, you know you need to have riders in order to have users and you need to have users in order to have riders. So you need to intervene in order to, to generate these indirect network effects. In the, in the business world, there are many of those. Uh, in payment services, uh, you need the shops to accept your credit card uh, because there are many users of the card and the users of the card, the, the card needs to be accepted in many shops. So you need to work on both sides of the market uh, at the same time. Same thing for Airbnb between the host and the people uh, who are going to, and the travelers, I would say, eBay between the sellers and the buyers. Um, so you need to think about the ecosystem, the entire ecosystem of your model and understand what are the incentives of the different parts of your ecosystem in order to design a, a system that is going to generate growth um, uh, in a very uh, creating, I would say, virtuous circles in, in, the, in the process. A good example is uh, the agriculture marketplaces that uh, we have seen over the recent years blossom across the world. Uh, when you look at the smallholder farmer, um, they need to buy inputs from providers that they buy through a trade. Uh, they need to, they will sell their, buy, their products to, to trade that will eventually go to buyers. The government is also interested in dealing with them because they, they need to, to provide services or collect data. You have all the financial services are also providing services to these people. So you have kind of a food ecosystem that you need to bring together. And the, the business of these ag marketplaces really is to reduce the cost of transaction in, in these systems. And that's what will require to understand what are the incentives, what are the constraints of each of the elements in the ecosystem, otherwise you won't be able to, to, to grow. So uh, I've, I've been running uh, through, uh, running you uh, through this framework of the three uh, blocks, I would say, of designing a holistic value proposition, providing all the solution, yet only the solution for all stakeholders, building a sustainable delivery system that first starts by leveraging unlimited resources, minimizes the use of the limited resources you absolutely require, and making sure you can source them in a sustainable way. And finally, accelerating your growth by thinking through the network effects that you can instill in your model in order to accelerate the growth or at least reduce the, the, um, the, the, the breaks, the, uh, what impedes uh, your growth. So I, to finish up, I would like to suggest for you, if you are in charge of a venture, or if you are an impact investor, to take one venture in your mind and ask yourself, uh, how far are we from being in a good position in all these eight criteria? And maybe you don't know. I would suggest you do that by yourself. Maybe you get your colleagues to also fill in the same form and you discuss it among yourselves to identify what are the limitations that are going to may prevent you to achieve sustainable impact at scale. With this, I'm done. Uh, I promise to Deborah to keep time for our conversation and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you for this extremely informative um, presentation and um, sharing with this your approach. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. I, um, we have a few questions uh, that came in the chat. Um, Derek, do you, do you want to share your question yourself to Olivier? 
Um, yes, well, Deborah, thank you so much. Um, yes, Oliver, uh, do you hear me well? Very well, thank you. Great, perfect. So it's been fascinating, very, very interesting. Um, I think the model is definitely scalable and provides let's say, an holistic approach, let's say, to opportunities. My question was really about innovation and, and mostly on the business model side. And uh, we have identified that sometimes actually uh, developing frontier markets um, a great source of innovation because it's what we call the innovation on a shoestring, meaning you have little means, um, you have to be intelligent, you have to think differently. And my question was about end markets. Did you see opportunities for, let's say, innovation sourced in frontier markets being eventually developed in developed markets? So really going from the south to the north as opposed to the other side. And could it leverage, of course, let's say, your approach? Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the famous reverse innovation, right? Um, uh, I would say, um, I would love to say yes, there are many instances, but oftentimes these shoestring innovations are, um, are made difficult to, imp to imp import because of all the restrictions. Um, established by regulations in the Western countries. When, uh, for instance, I, I remember trying to work in the field of construction about saying, okay, could we uh, import these kind of ideas? I mean, you have regulations everywhere, regulations that sometimes make sense, but in many instances have been um, driven by the manufacturers of solutions. And, when I was at McKinsey, where I spent 18 years, I, a lot of my work was done with industrial clients. And a lot of our work was about ensuring that the regulations would make it impossible to use other products than yours. Right? And so um, the, the level of regulation um, is such uh, that all these innovations are made extremely difficult uh, to, to import. I mean, that's a, I mean, obviously, Frontier markets, as you say, suffer from lack of regulation. But at the same time, there's a positive aspect that this enables innovation. Thank you, Olivier. But if you have, if some other people have examples, I would be very, very happy to hear from them. I mean, so microfinance is one example, right? Um, is one of the, of the innovations that has been imported. I mean, it, Except if you, are, I mean, it depends where you start the origin of microfinance. You could argue it was started in the Western markets in the 19th century and reinvented in the South and then reimported back. So good ideas travel indeed. Yeah, you can also think of M-Pesa, for example, in Kenya on the payment. M-Pesa is a very good example. Thank you. Another one that's technology being enabled where regulation is not there yet. Yeah, and, and there are others where you have, for example, a group of women who are developing, let's say, um, really hardware solutions to address energy, clean water, and this type of things, um, which could be very interesting for people going camping, for example, in, in the US. But uh, I do agree that regulation is a key challenge, but maybe new um, revenue models where maybe actually the people at the source of innovation sharing some of the revenues in developed markets could be an elegant way maybe to convince some regulators to, to think differently. Thank you for that, Derek. Thank you both. Um, Thierry, you have a question. Do you want to share your question with us? Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you and we okay. can see you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's a question to, uh, about the, 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 the people side of sustainability. Uh, we saw, as we saw at the beginning of your, of your presentation, Olivier, the, the key question is about uh, the, the balance between profits, planet, and people, mm -hmm. and we've seen a lot, uh, interestingly, in your in your in your framework about how to build an, a sustainable uh, business model, more or less, mm -hmm. uh, on the on the planet side. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more more on, on people on the people side? Are there some some key points, especially in the in the design of the solution, in the way you you come to the market, you understand your market and you try to understand the value that you could deliver. And also in the, in the engine, in, uh, in the growth engine phase, are there some, some aspects you, that, that uh, 
could be could be used or to 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 also illustrate this this uh, people side. Um, I mean, many of the examples I gave were actually having impact on people, right? So if mm -hmm. you think the the construction, if you think uh, the healthcare, Arabin. So I. Um, and honestly, there are probably more examples on the people side that have a positive impact on the people side than on the planet side. Um, now, if, if I understood correctly, your question was about how do you engage with consumers in order to come up with these ideas? Is, is this what you're asking? The people side can be, yes, uh, uh, try to tackle some, some, some problems so the consumers are obviously, but the, the people side of sustainability is also uh, how, uh, about the, the different different ways to make business, uh, the different ways to especially manage your people in inside of the, the firm, the, to manage the, the relationship between the different different actors. This is this is the people side uh, of sustainability, isn't it? Okay, yes, sustainability of your people resources, in, indeed. Um, yes. I, yeah, yeah. Um, what I, I think a, a good, uh, I don't have all the answers and maybe people in the room have, but one thing we looked at in, in detail was, um, because typically you need lots of people in the distribution activities, that, that's where you, the hundreds, uh, you have a few people in the plant and then hundreds in the roads to sell these products or services. Um, there was the idea that high turnover, high churn among this population was inevitable. Um, and that this was just the way it was. And you, I mean, you were spending your time hiring and training people. And after six months, they would leave you. And uh, that there was no, this was a, a law of nature and there was nothing to be done about it. And when we studied it in depth, we, we saw that some organizations had a very low turnover. They may have a high turnover in the first three months because this was a way to make sure that the people actually were fit for the job and the job was fit for these people. But, so, but beyond the initial three months, there was a very high stability, which enabled uh, to have actually them being quite independent that reduced the need for management time that allowed a greater span of control and also enabled also longer uh, quality and uh, trust-based relationship between these salespeople and their customers. But this was achieved by making sure that these people were very well paid. Right? Instead of spending money on your management and the supervisor of the supervisor of the supervisor and the training sessions, um, you had to make sure that the salespeople were good. And to, for them to be good, they had to make very good money. The, a very competitive, of the, this was the best job they could find in the area. It's a bit the equivalent of the automotive industry that used to spend a lot of money fixing the cars instead of making sure the cars were done perfectly in the first time. Uh, so if you, if you get your salespeople to be effective, then you get into a positive virtuous circle. With that may require investments in the beginning, but that's the only way forward. I don't know if that goes, is, answers a bit the question you had, but it's a very good one. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, Taun, you have a question as well for, for Olivier. Do you want to share it with us? If I can share it for you. And Taryn is asking, how does this framework differ from designing a normal unicorn? Are there aspects that are particular to social ventures? I mean, uh, I mean, the type of problems they tackle are obviously very different, right? But, um, uh, but I, it's all, I mean, for the, for the unicorns that are truly innovative, that are really tackling a really new problem, I think the mindset is quite similar in terms of um, coming up with a, a way of looking at things that no one has 
uh, had before. Um, and uh, I would say probably the um, something which is very different are the the aspirations of the entrepreneurs. If if the head of the unicorn, anyways, is isn't interested in going to IPO and making a lot of money and has a fundamentally a short term focus is only interested in meeting the KPIs that investors are pushing for, you, you may have problems. But at the same time, I'm saying this, I've seen um, aid agencies being as uh, ill-informed as the financial investors in driving social enterprises to doing the wrong things, right? By focusing on, on short-term focus. For instance, selling solar home systems an aid agency was providing uh, subsidies based on the number of solar home systems sold uh, for pay go companies, right? So there was no incentives in, for the company um, to ensure that uh, the people would actually use the systems and would and actually pay back the systems because they, they were equating selling a solar home system to being connected to the grid. Right, so I, I would say they, there are probably much more similarities than differences. Thank you, Olivier. Um, Laurent has um, two questions. Laurent, do you, you want to share your questions with us? Hi, thank you. Hi, Olivier. Thank you very much. Great presentation. I was not expecting less. Uh, so I'm Laurent Lyoto from Yokobok. We are the second online retailer in Senegal, yet with a strong social impact since we are serving the Senegalese uh, diaspora. Uh, Olivier, I had two questions. Um, a little frustration first. I think the examples were great. Uh, but I would like to see one organization that would stand out on all this. So may, maybe not the best one on all this, but one example uh, of great organization following your framework. So this would be the first question. The second that is a bit linked to the previous discussion is about the word of unicorn that I think was a great idea to use uh, to me, unicorn, are a silic it's a Silicon Valley word, uh, and it's, uh, it's coming from an ecosystem where you have abundant talent, money, expertise, and, and even a spirit. And so my question on this is, uh, what do you do when you don't have this ecosystem around you, and till where do you go to build it yourself? Because with your uh, frugal yet holistic or holistic yet frugal approach, um, you're, you're somehow covering it, but where is the limit? Because uh, are you, if you want to go holistic, do you do build you, your own university if you don't have talent, etc.? So two questions. Is there a great example on all this? And two, uh, can you do unicorns outside of Silicon Valley? Um, I think the examples I gave, um, I choose one aspect each time, eh, as you can, I'm sure you understood. But I think the, the Gramin Shakti hits many of the points. I think um, Sodas Patrimonioi, uh, Codensa, in quite a few. So I, I would not say Toyola, we haven't spoken about, but this also would be a good example. So, so I, I don't think any hits them all uh, perfectly, but um, but I and I for for me the I mean the, the the purpose of this is not to say someone there's someone there who is perfect, right? Because you say uh, a friend of mine who was short, a bit fat, and and no hair who was telling me, okay, now you tell me that to seduce a girl, I need to be tall, blonde hair and blue eyes. And what do I do? Right? Uh, so you, you need to, to, so the, the idea is to use this as a source of inspiration, as a, as a structured thinking process to get people to look at themselves and say, Hey, maybe I could do this. Maybe I could do that. 
So I'm not trying to, to describe something that works. And indeed, um, we have seen no inclusive business that has scaled at serving billions of people, right? So uh, all that is more a source of inspiration than just saying, okay, we have uh, solved the problem or someone has solved the problem. I'm not pretending we, we have. Um, the, the second question is, um, I mean, you, you, you have your answer in your question. You choose, you said, hey, unicorns come from the Silicon Valley. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not from the Southwest of France. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't work everywhere. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work everywhere. And surprise, surprise, you see areas in the world uh, where there are universities. If you go to Brac, right, you find ample resources of talent, of knowledge, of... Uh, uh, so there are some places that are the Silicon Valley of the world and not all countries, not all markets are able to be the source of innovation. Uh, sorry to say that, but it's... Um, that's what we have seen. So the question will become if, if you find these hotbeds of innovation um, and uh, how would innovation then be taken from these places and taken somewhere else, right? And so, uh, but that would be a different story. But it's, I don't think innovation will come, will be spread evenly throughout all countries. I, it would be, you need an ecosystem, you need a cluster, you need uh, people exposure. I mean, you need a Silicon Valley type effect, right? A cluster, I think our friend Michael Porter talked about it. Um, I think that's the way it will work. It's not good news for small countries. Thank you, Olivier. Um, Eric, um, we briefly touched upon um, your question. I hope we kind of answered it. If not, then give us a shout. Um, I want to be mindful with everyone's time. We have two minutes left for this session. Um, we have a few more questions. I'm sorry that we can't answer all of them. Um, Ali um, has a question. Ali, do you, do you want to share your the, the last question for, for this session? Uh, sure. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so some of your examples, when you, if you want to grow scale, you really have to standardize of some sort. I mean, you could do mass customization, but a certain level. I'll give you an example, your example of Arvind. Arvind is about converting an operation, which used to be done in what people in operations call it, the job shop, into a, a, an assembly operation. Now, a big requirement for this is standardization. So what they do actually, they do it by -ish. And extreme cases are still done in the old model, the old high cost model. And I think this is a very critical issue that prevents many social uh, kind of enterprises into converting into a mass scale, which is a necessity to becoming a unicorn. So in many aspects, I'm even questioning the validity of, of thinking in terms of unicorn in a, in a social setting. I mean, sometimes it's just not appropriate because you cannot just say, I'm going to take the easy case cases because it's standardized and I'm going to remove the rest. You still have to sort of cater for them in some way or the other. Thank you. Uh, th that's thank you, thank you, Ali. I, I think this is a very, very insightful challenge uh, rather than question, if you allow me. Um, but I, that's really my point about delivering only the solution as opposed to all the solution. I think the, the, if you want to, uh, I think there is, there is a mindset among NGOs, definitely, but sometimes social enterprises, which is to solve all the problems or the problems of all the people. And actually, even with the trend of saying the more desperate the situation, the more we want to make it our focus. Um, I think you need to know who are your target customers. Right? If you take Gramin Shakti, they clearly said, we are going to focus on the one who are spending $8 a month. The one who are not spending $8 a month, we cannot serve them. Right? So they were very focused, very, uh, it, it sounds very tough, I would say, very hard-nosed to say, no, we focus on those, therefore we won't treat these. 
but those that correspond to our business model, we are going to serve them all, right? And so I'm arguing that this needs to be a choice, right? It needs to be a choice about we are going to design our business model to serve the need of these people, which means these people we won't serve and we won't pretend to serve them because we want to serve them impeccably. We want to deliver 100% of the value they want 100% of the time. And for this, we need focus, we need standardization. Yeah. Thank you, Olivier. Um, I've got um, direct messages for one question, one more question. Let's be it. Let's um, let's take this one as a closing question. Um, uh, Bora has asked, um, uh, do you have an example how to motivate Nuj, the government's authorities slash authorities, authorities to enable social impact innovation on scale? Um, again, in many instances, it will be about uh, relaxing regulation. Um, but oftentimes, it could also be if you think about uh, import tariffs, right? There were tariffs on solar lanterns in Africa uh, at the same time as the government was subsidizing rural electrification. You say that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Does it? Or um, if you want to provide, to enable the provision of water uh, to uh, uh, informal settling, settlements, you need to relax the rule that everybody will pay the same price for water. You, you should stop pretending this. Or if you want to enable uh, decentralized rural electrification, you need to stop promising to these villages that they will get the electricity next year. Because who is going to buy a solar home system if the politician has promised that electricity will come next year? And the following, and the following, and the following, and 20 years later, they're still waiting for the electricity to come. So I think uh, providing uh, doing regulation in the right way, uh, providing certainty um, are things that government can do. I mean, in some cases, money might be involved, but in general, is about smart and stable regulation is what entrepreneurs need. Thank you for those closing words, Olivier. We, I think we could have gone on for another hour. We have non-stop questions coming in. Um, I, I want to just um, let you know that I'll be sharing Olivier's contact details and, and we'll be sharing this recording with this presentation. So I'm sorry if we couldn't answer all the questions, uh, but you can definitely follow up with, with Olivier. And if you know anyone in your personal network that should meet the team and Olivier and learn about their approach, please make sure to make the connection. I think it's very important that exactly in that area where um, Olivier is working in that uh, collaborations do happen and people learn from, from each other's experiences and that hands-on approach that, that Hystra has and Olivier has presented today. Thank you all to the to all our participants. Um, before you close, Olivier, do you, do you want to say something? Before I let go, everybody. Uh, I just want to thank you all for being there. When I when I'm looking at the the names on the on the on the screen, I feel embarrassed that I'm the one speaking because many of you are doing amazing work uh, in your own field and would be much more qualified than me uh, to to speak today. Uh, so I I'm humbled by the fact that you were listening. I hope you were not laughing all the time. And uh, I'm, uh, I really look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, and uh, I, I will just put my, would you, Deborah, kindly put my email address? I will, I will share everything with everybody in, in, in a follow-up email so everyone can so, contact you if they would like to. So Philip, Julien, I mean, you, you would be better people than me to talk about this. You are amazing entrepreneurs. Thank you.
Thank you all. And those that are not part for, of IFB, the Impact for Breakfast Network, you can find us on impactforbreakfast.com. Um, you can join our network, uh, be part of it. We have more of these sessions coming up. So join us um, for other virtual sessions. Thank you, everybody. I wish you a fantastic rest of the day and look forward to see you soon at another IFB. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Yeah.